This guy generates over $1 million per month while managing 50 people, writing a book, skyrocketing his YouTube channel, doing a PhD, and he's also counted to infinity, twice. He's read over a thousand studies on how to get more done, and it all started with a traumatic brain injury. If you've ever felt like you could be doing more, it's probably because you could. After watching this, I bet you'll implement some of his hacks that seem counterintuitive, but are backed by research, and you'll see immediate results. This is the third video in our 90 day goal series, and here we're gonna dive into how to get your brain into a state of insane focus on command, a weird technique he uses to trick his brain into enjoying difficult tasks, and how working less skyrockets your productivity. Meet Rian Doris. His key finding from all this research is our brain's ability to access a state of insane focus known as flow. Flow is an optimal state of consciousness where you feel your best and you perform your best, where you get completely immersed in what you're doing. Time dilates where hours go by and what feel like minutes. Research out of the University of Sydney that shows that creativity increases by over 400%, productivity increases by up to 500%, skill acquisition speed increases by up to 400% when in flow. How did you get into all of this? Uh, when I was 13, we found this semi-abandoned water park, went down this 100 foot sort of vertical slide, but the pool, it turned out, was only three foot deep. And so I just went headfirst into concrete. I couldn't hear, I could just hear this like reverberation. The next thing I remember is my dad shouting, oh no, oh no, oh no. And it took seven years to recover from. I had very debilitating symptoms from blurred vision, extreme levels of chronic fatigue, migraines. For years afterwards, I would forget the name of my close friends. And that pushed me into into reading, self-development. I came across this guy, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, and his research on flow state as this optimal state of consciousness. And I was enthralled by it because I was on the other end of the spectrum. I sort, sort of sought out all the information I could find on flow and came across Stephen Kotler. We worked for him for free for years and then had the opportunity to co-found the Flow Research Collective with him. So you guys upstairs as well, just so you know. I think, you, have you been on the roof? While we're filming, could you just like go a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go down a little bit? Yeah, that's better. We can just scale him down in the edit maybe. <laughs> One of the biggest blockers for flow is high allostatic load, physiological wear and tear you have on your body. So one of the key things to access flow consistently is actually recovery. The recovery is you setting your physiology up to be able to access peak performance when you are working. One of the key things to understand is the distinction between passive and active recovery. Passive recovery is just edging out in front of the TV, scrolling social media or whatever it is, and it doesn't actually accelerate the recovery process. Things that are relaxing don't necessarily drive recovery. Active recovery is engaging in an activity of some kind, accelerates the recovery process. It doesn't need to be an active activity, it could be sleep, sensory deprivation chambers, heat and cold are incredibly effective at clearing allostatic load. Is this a sauna up here? This is the sauna, yeah, yeah. So this is great for the old active recovery. It's not a sauna, it's the sauna. It's, yeah, six person, it's lovely, it's great. And then this is a uh, amazing ice bath actually. Work hard, recover hard. Exactly, and help people become executive corporate athletes is kind of the identity we encourage people to take on. Yeah, Jake. I'm an athlete! How are you feeling, dude, with your channel and everything, man? It's been, seems like it's going great. Uh, yeah, it seems like it. It's challenging at the moment. At the moment in particular? Or? Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a one man, one man show again. Yeah, it's interesting, man. It's, it's tough, because I've been going through a little bit of this as well. The circular sort of rhythm of progression can be and painful, you know, when you kind of like feel like you're back where you were. It's like, oh God, did, did any of it pay off? I'm just back here again. Yeah, kind of thing. yeah. The thing I try to remind myself of is that it's like, it's a spiral, not a circle. It feels circular, because you come ah. around. Yeah, exactly, but it actually spirals upward. It's uh, not a submarine despite the fact that it looks like it's a commercial grade hyperbaric oxygen chamber. So it basically just floods you with high quality oxygen. What are some of the weird things that you do to optimize productivity performance? Yeah, one funny one that I get made fun of a lot is wall staring. Right, I'm uh, out of <laughs> The ideal is that the thing you're doing when you're breaking from work or before work is less stimulating relative to the work itself. Wall staring, meaning literally just staring at a wall to allow boredom to set in, increases your reward sensitivity. It makes the thing that you're delaying seem more appealing than the incredibly boring thing of, of staring at a wall. That's counterintuitive because I think people like to reward themselves in a break. I respond to messages in my breaks in between yep. working and even that is stimulating. Exactly, the, pro the problem is that the dopamine starved rat inside of you, which everyone has, 
what's called a nucleus accumbens, is gonna wanna cling on to the activity you're doing in the break, rather than go back to the lower stimulation activity that you're trying to do as work. You wanna sort of leverage that inner dopamine hungry rat and starve it a little bit, and then it will crave work, hence the, the wall staring. But you can do, you know, it could be getting a glass of water, it could be stretching, it could be going for a little walk. Oh, this is the office. This is amazing. Plans. Yeah, it's not, it's very like, Inspiring. Sometimes I like just stroll up and down here, thinking about things or on calls. It's nice. This is great as well. It's so comfy, this chair. You can tell when someone's single just by looking at their room. <laughs> Mattress on the floor, <laughs> iPhone charger, nothing else. Distraction, absolutely one of the biggest blockers for flow. The time it takes to recover attention from an interruption is far, far greater than people think, almost like a snow globe. When a distraction occurs, that snow globe gets shaken and you get norepinephrine and dopamine into the system. One of the things that we emphasize people do is get good at the skill of distraction recovery. You're always gonna get distracted. So being able to quickly recover from distraction by letting the snow globe settle back down and you can use things like we talked about earlier, like wall staring, to help settle the snow globe back down of your attention access focus again rapidly. The screen is epic. Oh, it makes such a difference, I find. That's actually something that's 100% worth investing in. You can just move it. Oh, this little keyboard shortcut I learned actually from Sam Corkos, and it just splits your screen to thirds. Uh, I just kind of try and keep like everything I need open across all screens, so I don't, you just have to, you just go like that, basically. Do you see this? Did you capture this? Go. this is very nice for that. Big spreadsheets that are complex and things like that. It's very nice for it. That video, uh, I don't know if you saw it, the environmental rotation one. It basically just talks about how effort is anchored to your position and the environment that you're in. So if you reset your position and you move from sitting out like this to sitting normally or to standing, and then you rotate your environment, you reset the degree to which it feels like you've exerted effort within that given work period. And then this, the old standing motion board, you need this for standing, oh. in my opinion. Yeah, well it offsets the pressure. You're, you're constantly shifting pressure from one side to the other. When I stand after an hour, I'm like, oh. Exactly. In this many that, ways, standing is more exhausting than walking. It is, it is more exhausting. But With this, this, eight hours, not a bother. And then this treadmill desk makes a massive difference. So pull the screen over like that. So I'll, I'll use this sometimes like, five hours a day as well. It's a really nice hack. So you basically like, you just move here to the roof or whatever, and it just resets the degree to which psychologically you feel like you've been exerting effort, which increases endurance and how long it can work effectively. What drives you the most? Definitely some inferiority complexes, insecurity. Oh, I think everyone's drive is composed of multiple things. Like yeah. sometimes when I'm absolutely loving the thing we're creating, I'm driven by mastery and it's very- Tell me more about that inf inferiority complex. <laughs> You have that? You want to you want to sit me down on the, uh, <laughs> the psychoanalyst you chair? You have you have that too? Oh, massively. Really? Oh, massively. Yeah. Well, from Insanely what? Insanely badly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even now, I'm thinking you're you're joking. I'm not. You're joking. like sarcastic. I'm not joking. I'm serious. <laughs> uh, I mean, when I was 13, nearly died of the head injury, and I've just always had like a very deep sense of inner lack, not being worthy, not being lovable, and when you feel like that on the inside, you try and build up all this sh on the outside try and make sure that you prove to yourself and others that you are someone and you are of significance. And that's been a big, big part of my drive, 100%. And I'm aware of it, which is good. So it means I'm, I'm able to like work through it and it's gotten better over the years. So maybe we are more driven by pain than... It's true, it's true. I mean, well, to get in the game at least, as I was saying earlier, I hope in five years, 10 years, the degree to which the pain is composing my drive is much lower and the degree to which it's based on purpose and contribution and creation and positive things is much higher as a percentage of the total drive. You know, as you sort of achieve more or earn more or whatever it is, the comparison points become greater and the delta or the gap between you and the things you're comparing yourself actually become bigger than they were. And that comparison gap is a big driver of unhappiness, I think, at least for me. And so that, that's been something I've been contending with a little bit as well. A simple example would be, before you have a YouTube channel, you never compare how many subscribers you have to someone else. Once you have a YouTube channel and it's moving, you start to, you know, all of a sudden you have X amount less subscribers than somebody else has. Something you want to tell me, maybe? Or... <laughs> we can talk about Dude, it. How many have you got on me? If you overtake me, I may just delete my channel. <laughs> You're doing five massive things, and this is all I'm doing. If you be, don't take this from me, I'll stay right behind you. I'll just, I'll, I'll nibble at your heels a little bit. But yeah, how are you doing on that front in general? I'm happier than I've ever been. You are, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. What's contributed to that? Um, I'm doing what I love. I have amazing friends around me, and I've trained myself a lot. So that's something I'm currently working on. 
And I want to talk you. to Marissa P about that too because oh, she's, yeah, a, yeah. she's a world leading hypnotherapist. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one of the things I'm doing is listening to a hypnosis every morning nice. when I go for a walk. Dude, I've been meaning to do that actually. That's a, good, that's a great call. This is a simple sort of cheap flow hack that actually works surprisingly well is what we call wake up and flow. When you wake up in the morning, your brain waves are closer to flow. And rather than waking fully up, actually starting work half asleep immediately, you know, a minute after you wake up, and then essentially waking up in a flow state rather than fully waking up and then trying to drop back down to flow. The other reason this is advantageous is the cognitive load, which is the amount of information you're storing in working memory at any given moment, that's lowest when you wake up because you haven't been thinking about things, nothing has entered your consciousness. Total amount of RAM that you have to allocate to work is highest. What we generally recommend people do is do some sort of a reboot routine after they've done this flow block of let's say 90 minutes to three hours, recover from flow like we talked about and then re-enter the flow cycle at, you know, 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or whatever it is afterwards. Another misconception is the importance of getting up early to get stuff done, when in fact, there are different chronotypes, meaning a person's natural tendency to sleep and wake up at certain times, and also when they're most productive. The way that I encourage people to think about it from a flow perspective is that you've really got two categories of time in the day. There's your chronotype zone, or the time of the day where your physiology is most primed for cognitive exertion. And this depends on what your chronotype is. Some people are larks, which means that this chronotype zone takes place very early in the morning, like 5 a.m. to 11 a.m. Some people are third birds, which means it's, they skew toward the morning, but it's not as early. It maybe is 9 a.m. till lunchtime. And then some people are owls, which means that they have a chronotype zone later at night, sometimes you know from midnight all the way till 4 a.m. The painful thing that a lot of people unfortunately do is they squander this optimal biology, so they'll do a workout in the chronotype zone. It's running errands, same with meetings. Know what your chronotype zone is, and then use that window always for your highest priority tasks. The second category of time in the day is what we call the trough. It's basically any time that is not your chronotype zone. So as much as possible, we wanna throw all the activities that don't really benefit from peak cognition into the trough and then preserve the chronotype zone for all the activities where we're trying to have really good, deep peak cognition within. This reminds me of this Richard Branson interview where he was asked for his number one productivity hack and he only said two words, work out. For me, I've noticed there are three reasons why I don't work out consistently. And I wanna thank Copilot for sponsoring this video and helping me with this. One thing that Rian shared with me was how friction stops us from getting into flow. And I noticed the same thing happened to me with workouts where I would show up at the gym, not have a plan and just have to make something up on the spot, which made it less likely for me to work out. Copilot partners you up with a personal trainer who creates a custom workout plan for you and your specific goals. I told my coach Kara, who's awesome by the way, shout out to Kara, that I wanna hit all muscle groups, work out three times a week and be as efficient as possible. Now I just follow my custom workout that she set up for me using the app, which makes it super easy and it removes a lot of friction for me. Secondly, I had no accountability. My trainer Kara can and see my workouts, adjust them based on my performance and my requests, and I build up a streak that I don't wanna lose. Busy day today, so I asked Coach Kara to prepare a home workout, told her what equipment I have, boom, she put something together for me. And thirdly, to be honest, I didn't really know what I was doing. I don't think you're doing them right. What? Jokes aside, I told her that I've been having lower back issues, so she added more core exercises like the farmer's carry, and my lower back is improving. So click my Copilot link or scan the QR code to get a 14-day free trial with your own personal trainer. How many hours a week do you work? Remember you asked me that last time? Is it something you think about a good bit? <laughs> you like, do think about that too? I do too. I do too. It's, a, it's a funny, it's like one of those internal mental hangups that I have at least that I feel like we share in common around... Uh, Am I working enough? Days. Exactly. Am I fucking <laughs> doing enough? For like 50 hours a week roughly. I really try to let go of it because it holds you back massively. Like we were talking about earlier, you know, if you get stuck in like task completion dopamine seeking mode. You don't zoom out enough to know what the f***ing big moves are to make. And a lot of the biggest moves like hiring and stuff like that, you don't get a sense of task completion or dopamine because they're like high impact, low likelihood. So the, the chance of you getting a sense of completion is very low, but eventually you will fundamentally change the game for yourself. That like productivity obsessed kind of thing suppresses those big leaps massively. By that you mean ticking off a lot of small tasks that feel like you're making a lot of progress because look at the five things I did today. Any task that you know you will definitely progress upon, the biggest things you don't know that you will actually make progress on them, like hiring or some massive partnership or some game-changing idea, they're like high potential, low certainty. I hate those. 
But those, those are the unlocks. Those are, that's what billionaires spend all their time doing. Billionaires spend all their time having fucking lunch with people. <laughs> stuff like that, you know what I mean? Because eventually one of those lunches is going to become something enormous. You take a hit on short-term results. You have to let go of some short-term results to build a leverage that are going to get you way bigger long-term results. One of the things that I would emphasize is, is work compression. A friend of mine who was building a startup got Lyme disease and could only work three hours a day. And he had this tiny compressed little box that he could do work in until his just body would give out and he couldn't do any more work. What was crazy to observe was that he got more effective and more productive. The higher your level of perceived importance or priority level of a given task, the more dopamine your brain ends up secreting as you go in to focus on that thing. It's almost like having productivity HD goggles on where you start to be able to see things that weren't differentiated in terms of their priority or importance all of a sudden become wildly differentiated. I always recommend that people pick a box for their work week that is a lower number of hours than they currently work and that they compress their work down to fit into that box. And you unlock this whole new set of productivity superpowers to find more effective ways to do things, to work faster, build more leverage, to differentiate between priorities, to delay things, to focus on the essential over time compounds and allows you to acquire far more leverage and be way more effective. I actually gave up coffee a week after I released that caffeine video. There was something about the caffeinated state that felt incongruent with what how I needed to be for the business to keep growing. I needed to slow down for the business to speed up. Calm, clear, long-term thinking, able to discern what matters. I feel like that's something I maybe should do right now as well. I feel like when you're working every day like I am at the moment, it's really hard to be creative. And then yeah. you just end up being anti-productive. We end up making work that actually you have to redo. Like if yeah. I decide on the wrong video, I'm busy for two weeks straight, just working nonstop, but I picked the wrong video. It's less time doing, more time deciding, which is counterintuitive and it like that flies in the face of a lot of the sort of like more junior success advice, which is just take action, take action, take action. But once <laughs> you've got a thing moving, it's more about, yeah, moving in the right direction rather than redundant work that can easily slip in, I think, yeah. so. I mean, leverage is just input cost relative to output value. Almost all productivity advice is about how to jack up your inputs rather than the ratio between input and output. Use keyboard shortcuts so you can get more, you know, words per minute typed or how to reorganize notions so you can more quickly pull up knowledge or whatever it is. What it tends to grossly under focus on is things you can do to create a delta between input costs and output value such that one hour results in, you know, 10 hours of output value or whatever it is. The most important thing is firstly viscerally understanding it. And that's something I've noticed as a key distinguisher with the best CEOs and operators is they constantly are hunting for leverage. The human brain I think is really bad at grasping exponentiality. It's called linearity bias. The brain is local and linear. We can't wrap our head around exponential curves. It's very, very, very difficult for us to understand. And it blocks most people's minds from being able to properly wrap their heads around how things would compound if only they could, you know, focus on that which will compound. One of the funny things that Matt told me that you do is when you're trying to get something done, you're like, how can we get this done in three minutes? <laughs> Instead of like, 90 minutes. One of the main triggers for flow is called the challenge skills balance. Basically just demonstrates that we can best access flow when the challenge level of the thing we're engaging with slightly outstrips our current skill level. And so there's a number of different ways you can tune the challenge skills balance. One is actually to use time, compress down the amount of time for a boring tasks like your taxes. Yeah, there's a great book by a CEO that I'm a big fan of. He built a billion dollar company, then a $10 billion company, and then took Snowflake, which is the current company as the CEO of, to $100 billion. The book's called Amp It Up, and the idea is simple, which is that there is a huge amount of latent potential just sitting in every single organization. Every person is just working more slowly than is necessary or on the wrong things. And one of the biggest sources of latent potential, I think, comes in the form of timelines where people just arbitrarily set very long timelines or deadlines for things rather than creating the forcing function of a very short deadline and seeing what's possible to be able to achieve that. There's a really bizarre phenomenon called hysterical strength. You know, a car driving over a woman's son and a woman that's 150 pounds being able to lift up that car and hold it up for three minutes. Certain very specific instances humans can have this huge level of capacity that's way beyond their normal baseline. You know, and I think the same is the case at the psychological level. You can handle not just a bit more than you think you can handle, you can handle way, 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 way more than you think you can handle. We have these internal reservoirs of resilience that can only be accessed and cracked open when certain very challenging conditions are placed upon us. 
But what you can do is place those conditions upon yourself, load up the total challenge level in your life, taking on 10 times more than you think is conceivably possible. And then you deload it back down afterwards, after a short intensive sprint of this. How short? Usually one to three months. A lot of people, they wanna get better at something. They wanna reach a new level. They wanna embody a new trait. And they think once I embody that new trait, then I'll be able to get this result. Exactly. But what I found now, commit to the output and then you're just forced to change. Yep, the, the, the circumstance needs to precede the trait. So if you haven't already set a challenging goal until the end of the year, do it now and join us. Check out my co-pilot link for a 14 day free trial. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.